Welcome to the Doc Talks podcast, a conversation on what's new and relevant in the world of Canadian medicine and hospital healthcare. I'm your host, Ian Gillespie, and I'm here to ask the questions and find the answers you need to know. We want to help our listeners know how to prevent and detect illness and how to navigate our healthcare system. Be sure to subscribe to the Doc Talks podcast to stay up to date on new episodes and follow us on Twitter at St. Joseph's London or visit sjhc.london.on.ca slash podcast. Hello, I'm Ian Gillespie. Welcome to the Doc Talks podcast, brought to you by St. Joseph's Healthcare London. Did you know that how you walk can indicate how healthy your brain is? Studies have shown how someone walks and how fast can be an early predictor of future falls, frailty, dementia, and even life expectancy. According to the Cleveland Clinic, by age 60, 15% of people will have an abnormal gait, a number that jumps to 80% once we hit 85 Today, I'm talking to Dr. Manuel Montero Odasso, a geriatrician at St. Joseph's Healthcare London and a scientist with the Gait and Brain Lab at Parkwood Institute. He's also a team leader and co-leader of many initiatives in research and clinical improvement, such as the Canadian Consortium on Neurodegeneration and Aging, the Canada Research Dementia Strategy, and the Ontario Neurodegenerative Research Initiative, as well as a lead of the National Synergic Trial a study looking at ways to delay dementia in older adults using physical exercises combined with cognitive training and nutritional interventions. Thank you, Dr. Montero Odasso, for joining us today, sir. Thank you very much, Ian, and the St. Joe's family for having me. I'm very excited about this conversation to help our audience. So I've just done a little bit of reading and so forth. It's a fascinating thing, and I'm, I'm not even sure how to start, but how is gait, how is how we walk related to our cognitive ability. What's the relationship there? Well, it's it's very interesting because in the past, we did believe that walking was automatic, right? In fact, when I was a medical school in the 80s, we were taught that walking was totally automatic because the model studying walking and biology used cats to understand gait and walking. And there is a model they called the the decorticate cat in where they cut the connection between the brain and the spine and the cat keep walking. So it was thought that humans were like, seem like cats, but we're not cats. <laughs> Something we do know is that some aspects of walking are automatic, but others need our control from the cortex of the brain, particularly the frontal lobe, because walking and navigation needs attention, switching, and inhibition. For instance, Think about you need to cross a very busy street in where there's a lot of traffic and people coming towards you and you want to go to the other part of the corner. So you need to see who is coming to you. You need to watch the traffic light. You need to avoid if there is some cobblestone there bugging you. So you need to pay attention. And the difference where you place your foot while walking may be the difference between a trip or not tripping, right? While if you walk in a corridor, chat very smooth, in our hospital, it's automatic because it's very even and there is no obstacles. Importantly, all this started with some research done in the 90s about a test that the name was Stop Walking While Talking. Stop Walking While Talking. Yes, I will tell you about that. So in a nursing home in Norway, a geriatrician was inviting the resident of the nursing home to do some rehabilitation exercises from the dining room to the gym. And this geriatrician, Dr. Ludin Olson, she notices that some people, while going from the dining room to the gym, they need to stop walking to say, hello, doctor, how are you doing? While others were able to walk and greet her and say good morning. And she started thinking, why some people, all their individuals in this nursing home, need to stop to tell me good morning because they are more polite, more kind than the other that keep walking? So she followed those residents in that nursing home and she found that those older individuals, mean age 75, that needed to stop walking while greeting her, they suffer more falls in the future and they were more likely to have mortality earlier that those residents in nursing homes 
that were able to walk and greet her, so walk and talk at the same time. And she published that just in a half of the page in a journal that is very respected with the Lancet. And that was, I think, 1994 or 1997. Since then, this was expanded and we came out, my team and other groups in the world, with how we can make this a test. So how this walking while talking can be a test. So basically, you're going to realize that when you walk and you have an activity that challenges your brain, you will slow down. And that is normal to slow down. The key is how much you slow down and you need to stop completely, right? So if you try, for example, to do calculations, and you can try in your home, right? In the center of your home. And you try to walk in a safe corridor doing very complex subtractions, 100 minus 7. So you try to walk and say, okay, 100 minus 7, 93. 93 minus 7, 86, 86 minus 7, 79, and so on, you're going to see your slow down. And that's normal. Why? Because walking is not only automatic. Needs your brain, your cortex, particularly your frontal area, in order to get attention, to help in the navigation, and to help you with the final motor skills. The thing our research and others discover is you slow down very much, more than 20% of the baseline speed, or you need to stop because you cannot do both activities at the same time. You may have some lack of resources in your brain, perhaps because you have an early neurodegeneration, which is the most important cause of dementia, or you may have some vascular changes like a high water hypertensity in your brain that is associated with hypertension and diabetes, and so on. And we expand that finding in a large study and a cohort study we have done here in London, Ontario, in where we have been followed so far 500 people for the last, I would say, 15 years, we're starting in 2007, in where we found that if you have early cognitive problems that we call mild cognitive impairment, and if you're not able to do this walking and talking test, those individuals are more likely to go to dementia in the next year compared with those that despite the cognitive problem, they can cope the situation and do the two activities in the same time. Right. Wow. And so in addition, though, to the that sort of walking, talking connection, I mean, there's all kinds of different gates, right? You might shuffle, someone yeah. might limp, sway, there are balance problems and so forth. So are you learning then that all those have very specific different connections to later cognitive problems? I mean, can you break it down somehow? I... That's a great question because the beauty about this walking and talking test or dual task gate because your gait is walking while doing other challenging for your brain tasks, dual tasks, you try to do the thing, two things at a time, is that we don't care about the absolute performance. We do care about the relative performance. What do you mean of this? To make it simple. If you already walk slow because you have a very severe knee pain for your arthritis or because your ankle is damaged because you have an injury and a fracture. Yes. Doesn't mean your walking is abnormal, you go to dementia. We compare this slow walking and how much do you slow your already slow walking while trying to do the cognitive task. So the relative reduction. So normal walking speed, if you don't have any injury in your lower limbs or you don't have any neuropathy in your nerves in the lower limbs and you don't have extreme overweight, should be over one meter per second when you're over 65. But if you already walk slow, 0.8, because you have a severe near osteoarthritis, and when you do the cognitive challenge, you slow down to 0.6, that is an 18% reduction. That is considered normal. And both are slow, but you're slow because there are arthritis in your knee, not because you're going to go to dementia. But if you're slow to 0.4, well, that means despite you walking slow at 0.8, when you're doing a cognitive ability, you reduce 50% your speed. And that's not because the arthritis or your pain. It's because your brain cannot do the two activities at the same time. So it's talking about mm. early damage in your brain. Right. This may seem like a silly question. It's kind of a chicken and the egg thing. Can someone stave off possible dementia by working on their gait, improving their gait? Is Unfortunately not. However, gait is a marker. It's not a cause. Right. So this is slowing while trying to do the two things at the time. It's a marker that's happening in your brain. So if you do physical exercises, you will improve your gait and also you will reduce your risk of dementia because we do know that physical exercise, particularly the combination of aerobic exercise and weight training exercise, 
are not only good for your heart, but also good for your brain. So we do know today, for the study done by our group and others, in particular the seminal finger trial done in 2015, that specific physical exercises are very important to maintain your brain health. And there are several explanations. It seems, you know, it's not only the better blood flow to your brain, it's also you release your muscles and your body release some substance to the blood, cytokines that are important for the brain and for the neurons. So there are several potential biological explanations. They are a little complex, perhaps, for our audience. But my point is, evidence for very well-conducted research studies are showing that physical exercise reduces your risk to go to dementia. And importantly, there is potential biological explanation supporting those findings. So I guess I should ask, how then, first of all, do you go about diagnosing a problem with someone's gait? Basically, impairment in the gait, when you can see it, I think can be related, as you said, for causes related to your knees, your angles, whatever. We're more important about this relation with cognition and gait. In general, the thing we do and we try to establish that in our clinics here in St. Joseph. Dr. Michael Borey and Dr. Jenny Wells have a memory clinics in where they are applying all those tests. We look, if you already have cognitive problems and we see you and you have this mild cognitive impairment because we did some neuropsychological testing, we perform this gait testing. And based on this gait testing, we can tell our patients and participants, you may have this higher risk or this lower risk. So we can do it. So clinicians can do it. And now we try to apply this in national guidance a national consensus, and we have published to be applied in several clinics. So people like Dr. Camicholi doing in Alberta, Dr. Verret doing in Montreal, so this has been applied. But importantly, something that we like to transmit is not only that when you detect that your gait is not good enough, you should consult the clinician just to know it's just normal aging or something else happening, is that physical activity, and if you combine with other lifestyle interventions, can help in your gait and your brain health. So we do know for decades that physical exercise will improve your mobility and your gait. But there is a a variety of physical exercises. So the physical exercise to reduce falls or to improve your balance are not necessarily the same physical exercise that will improve your brain health in order to delay dementia, right? The recommendation today is to try to do, if you're over 65, at least three times a week, 40 minutes of combined aerobic exercise with some kind of resistant training, right? Because they seem that combination is the best combination to improve your brain health. And this is also, this recommendation mirrors the World Health Recommendation for Brain Health. The problem in our daily living is like if you and me were having right now, is that our activities or our cognitive activities are very sedentary. I cannot see my patients in my clinic while walking or running. I cannot have this podcast with you while running. We need to sit. So basically the problem is we sit too much. So today we do know that sitting is the new smoking. So it it, is very detrimental for our health. So our day had 24 hours. The the only thing we're asking and we should think about that is too much to us to our day at least one hour of physical activity in order to protect our hard brains, just one hour per day. It looks simple, but in real life, it's very complicated, very challenging. With our modern life, we cannot find that hour. So the recommendation is at least 40 minutes, three times per week, and to maintain it. So you've talked about the importance of walking and and, uh, at least 40 minutes, right, of aerobic and walking activity three times a week. Do I have that one correct? It is aerobic and resistant training. It's aerobic and weights. Oh, aerobic and resistance training. Are there other interventions one can do, physical interventions, to help? Yeah, there is like, we, we try to call in medicine lifestyle interventions because, okay. uh, and that's a great question because studies have demonstrated that not only physical exercises can improve your mobility and your brain health and delay dementia, some other interventions are simple like a, have a healthy diet, have a good mm-hmm. sleep, have some cognitive training where you train your cognition and ability and socialization may delay dementia. Importantly, the finger trial, that was a large trial done in Europe with 2,000 individuals at risk of dementia, 
demonstrated that combination of exercises plus diet, but cardiovascular control delayed dementia and make the news and was published in Lancet in 2015. And our study, the synergic trial that was conducted in five cities across Canada, being St. Joseph and London, the sponsor site, and probably some people listening to this podcast were patients in our study, we demonstrated that combining physical activity, some exercise with quality training in a tablet, you can improve your cognition and even delay cognitive decline. And right now, we're conducting the Synergy 2 trial in where we're delivering remotely using platforms like Zoom, podcast, whatever, with effective coaching, with coaches, especially trained, how you can change your behavior, how you can move more, how you can improve your diet without taking food from your diet, you know, right? To add in a special thing, how we can improve your sleep with some behavioral therapy, because the sleep is very important for your brain to maintain your brain health, how we can give you quality training in where you deliver and you have the quality training to improve. And we found in our study, in the synergic one, that the combination is better than the individual interventions. It seems there is some synergism. And all those lifetime interventions is part of the future dementia treatment because it has been very difficult to find medication that cure dementia. We have a hope right now because there is some emerging therapies, some intravenous antibodies against the amyloid protein that it seems may reduce the amyloid low in the brain, which is believed very, very important to develop dementia. But unfortunately, not everyone will be candidate to those medications because there are several contraindications. But lifestyle interventions, everyone can be a candidate to lifestyle intervention. And we hope in the future, we provide both to our community, to our patients. Combination of these life interventions plus those medications in order to delay dementia. In some people, we can cure it. We can stop the progression. But so far, at this stage, the goal is to delay dementia. And the studies can show that you can delay the decline with this intervention between six months to two years, depends the study you read. So there is a, a very interesting emerging evidence that the combination of these lifestyle interventions may help you in your cognitive decline to stop it and to delay progression to dementia. Right. And I just wanted to touch on also the risk of falling. We know how devastating that can be to seniors. Often after a fall, people's health really deteriorates and so forth. So is that part of it? I mean, can you assess someone's gait and can that sort of determine their risk of falling? By all means, you're totally correct. In fact, I would say low cognition and high rate of falls when you're over 65, I would say can be seen as the two faces of the same coin. So we do know that when more cognitive problems you have, more risk of falls you have. So, and in my practice here in Parbul Hospital, in the geriatric rehabilitation unit, we receive a lot of clients that suffer a fall and a fracture and are over 75, over 80. And it's not uncommon to make a new diagnosis of cognitive impairment that was overseen. Because we do know when older individuals over 65, they have high risk of falls. If you have cognitive problems, you double or they triple the risk of falls when you compare with the same individual, your or your own age, your own comorbidity without cognitive impairment. And why is that? Well, as I said before, the prefrontal lobe, the, fr the prefrontal area of the frontal lobe are very important to regulate and to maintain your normal gait. So when you already have some cognitive problems, it's because some areas of your brain, particularly in the prefrontal lobe, hippocampus, or parietal area, they are not working as well, which are key areas to regulate your reflexes and your walking. So your reflexes are not as fast as before. The way you place your feet or the timing in where you place your feet can be the difference between falling and not falling. Suppose you are walking in the street and you trip again and stone there. You body will generate a series of reflexes in order to place the foot correctly to avoid falling and to try to keep the upright position that we call reflex strategies. We have the ankle strategy, the hip strategy, the stepping strategy, there are several strategies that are normal in us. But if your cognition is not working well, the speed of those reflexes is altered and it's going slow. And sometimes a different milliseconds in where you place your foot or how fast you place your foot in the right place is the difference between falling and not falling, right? So that's the, that's the reason why people with cognitive impairment 
have higher risk of falls and injuries due to falls compared with people without cognitive impairment. What about on the horizon, sort of heading into the future? Is uh, this research, uh, are there any new directions or developments that you see uh, coming in, in this field? I think the best way to predict the future is to create it. As I think Abraham Lincoln said that. So we are creating the future. I think the future is how we can effectively deliver these interventions remotely and at home. How technology can help us. How wearables and information giving feedback to our clients or our patients can help us in order to motivate them to do the physical activity. Because we do know that having a healthy diet, losing weight, doing physical exercises, taking your medication that have very good control of your diabetes, hypertension, and vascular risk factors are important for dementia, for falls, and so on. The problem is sometimes it's very difficult to achieve those interventions, but sometimes very mm -hmm. difficult to do those changes. So we mm -hmm. believe that effective coaching, so having a coach communicating with you at home, virtually or remotely, reminding you can help you with a technology, some wearables that inform you, okay, you need to stand up, you need to move, and you get feedback can help you. I think that is the next step about how we can apply effectively all these interventions and then research are working, but they are not yet applied in real life to our patients. Dr. Montero Adasso, how can people get involved in some of the research projects that uh, you're involved with? Thank you very much for that question, yeah, because this is key for us. We, got, we rely on the community to help us and to get volunteers to join our study, and they will get the benefit in where they will receive coaching for this intervention. In our website, gateandbrain.com, is all the information, but also in the St. Joseph Foundation and in St. Joseph Hospital, you can reach us in the Division of Genetic Medicine to provide a donation you want to help us in our study, because sometimes, you know, although we have done very well in research funding for the government, all the time we need more resources. But again, gateandbrain.com is our website and uh, all the information in there. In fact, there is an email, which is info at gateandbrain.com in where you can contact us for this information. Excellent. And I think we could list those in the, the notes on the website for the podcast too. So for listeners, thank you. So I guess one general takeaway though for listeners might be Get up out of that chair. Is that fair to say? I mean, uh, Get up and move. Again. our body and our brain have been designed to move. So it's important to move and it's important to move with someone because it seems what you do in social bonding and socialization is good. One very good activity we believe should have both advantages is dancing. And oh. unfortunately, when we do research in dancing, it's not as good and what we do, the physical exercise with the COVID training combined. So it seems what you do more intense is better than dancing. But dancing is fun, so we recommend dancing too. All right. Well, that's good advice. Fascinating topic. Dr. Montero Adasso, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me, guys. That's it for this episode of the Doc Talks podcast. Thanks for joining us. And join us next time when we'll continue our conversation on what's new and relevant in the world of Canadian medicine and hospital healthcare. Be sure to subscribe and follow us on Facebook and Twitter at St. Joseph's London. Or visit sjhc.london.on.ca slash podcast. Until then, stay healthy. Stay healthy.